Hello, nephew community. My name is Sean George, medical science liaison with Otsuka Pharmaceutical Development and Commercialization. I am excited to be here today with Dr. Edgar Lerma, as he will be providing us with an overview of hypertensive nephrosclerosis. Dr. Lerma earned his doctor of medicine from the University of Santo Tom Thomas uh, Faculty of Medicine and Surgery in Manila, Philippines. He completed residency training in internal medicine at UIC Mercy Hospital and Medical Center, where he also served as chief resident. He completed a fellowship in nephrology and hypertension at Northwestern Memorial Hospital, the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University, and the Veterans Administration Lakeside Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois. At present, he holds the rank of clinical professor of medicine with the section of nephrology at the University of Illinois at Chicago. He serves as the educational coordinator for nephrology with UIC Advocate Christ Medical Center. And we just want to thank you so much for being here today, Dr. Lerma. Thank you for having me, Sean. So, um, so we know that hypertensive nephrosclerosis is one of the most common causes of end-stage renal disease worldwide. Can you do? Uh, can you provide a, a just a brief overview of what hypertensive nephrosclerosis is? So, hypertensive nephrosclerosis, Sean, is is a disorder that is usually commonly associated with chronic hypertension. Um, there are several factors that are involved. Being black uh, is associated with an eightfold increase in the risk of hypertension in those end stage kidney disease. There's actually been some literature alluding to the association between the APOL1 gene and kidney disease in African Americans. Now, when we say hypertensive nephrosclerosis, it actually includes FSGS and hypertension related end stage kidney disease. Now, can you uh, provide a basic overview of the pathophysiology of the disease? Well, you know, before I go into that, you know, um, I have to say the term hypertensive nephrosclerosis is actually considered as a misnomer by many. Um, as the name implies, it implies that hypertension is the cause of nephrosclerosis rather than vice versa, which, you know, again, it, it is not a, uh, it's not like black and white like that. If, if we go historically, the term nephrosclerosis, which actually means kidney hardening was actually coined in 1918 by German clinicians and pathologists Franz Volhard and Theodor Farr. And the et etymology really refers to the hardened consistence of the kidneys after they are cut uh, during autopsy. The hardening suggests tissue fibrosis and in essence can apply to most chronic kidney diseases. In fact, nephrosclerosis is in a way, an easy way out for classifying any case of chronic kidney disease in a hypertensive and or aging patient in the absence of a kidney biopsy. So if you um, if you talk about the pathophysiology of the disease and we, we look at hypertensive nef nephrosclerosis under the microscope, um, when one thinks hypertensive nephrosclerosis, we have to look at the, the vascular the glomerular and tubular interstitial involvements. So vascular wise, uh, it refers to the enthymal thickening and luminal narrowing of the large and small renal arteries and glomerular arterioles. These are usually brought about by an initially adaptive mechanism um, or a hypertrophic response to chronic hypertension. Um, histopat histopathologically, this is manifested by um, medial hypertrophy and fibro plastic enthymal thickening, and then their subsequent deposition of hyaline-like material uh, into the damaged, more permeable arterial wall. As far as the glomerular component, the glomeruli exhibit both focal global as well as focal segmental sclerosis. And then lastly, if you look at the tubular interstitial space, although the etiology of interstitial fibrosis is not completely understood, it is believed that this interstitial disease in the ischemic kid kidney is really brought about, at least in part, by an active immunologic process initiated by ischemia-induced alterations in antigen expression on the surface of tubular epithelial cells. So when these patients come to you, 
and you're you're trying to come up with a diagnosis of what is causing their renal disease how often do you actually biopsy these patients that you know probably for sure have hypertensive kidney disease or the cause of their elevated creatinine um, is because of hypertensive nephro. Do you typically biopsy these patients or no? So the answer is no, we don't usually biopsy these patients. Um, mm. When we talk about kidney biopsy, there are usually indications for doing a kidney biopsy. Let's say uh, a patient has unexplained uh, kidney failure or unexplained chronic kidney disease, uh, in the presence of, say, normal-sized kidneys with a rapidly progressive decline in GFR, or in addition, like nephrotic range proteinuria, uh, abnormal urine microscopy, like the patient has RBCs in the urine, RBC cast, so on and so forth. Those are the typical indications for doing a kidney biopsy. So when these patients with the hypertensive nephrosclerosis present, they don't usually uh, meet the criteria for performing a kidney biopsy. Well, thank you for answering that. So that kind of leads me into my next question. You kind of partially answered it already, already, but what do these patients with hypertensive nephrosclerosis typically present with clinically? And what do you as a nephrologist look for as you work these patients up? What, what does your workup look like? So, uh, Sean, to answer that question, one really needs to appreciate that, as I said earlier, nephrosclerosis is seen with normal aging but it's exacerbated by chronic hypertension. So um, most of my patients, well, I, I guess all of my patients, I always tell them that as we get older, our kidneys go down in function as it is part of normal aging. If you look at it from that perspective, you can you tend to understand that there will be three major groups of patients who will be at increased risk. So Africans Americans, African Americans, those with more marked elevations in blood pressure, and those with underlying chronic kidney disease. Uh, an example are, are those patients with diabetic kidney disease. Clinically, they usually have a long history of hypertension, uh, most often accompanied by left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, slow progressive rise in BUN and creatinine, as well as a normal urinary sediment. One characteristic is that these patients have mild proteinuria. They are non-nephrotic. The proteinuria tends to be less than one gram per day, and this generally reflects the nature, the focal nature of glomerular involvement. One lab test that um, is uh, commonly seen also is the presence of hyperuricemia, independent of diuretic therapy. Some um, clinicians actually suggest that this is an early finding and may actually reflect the decreased renal blood flow induced by the vascular disease. And another uh, test that we commonly order are imaging studies, say like a renal ultrasound. And in usually they tend to show normal size kidneys, but at times when it's chronic, uh, you could see uh, bilateral renal atrophy or uh, shrunken kidneys. So with that said, the diagnosis really is usually inferred, and I, I have to emphasize inferred, from the characteristic clinical features mentioned and the exclusion of other kidney diseases, since as we said earlier, kidney biopsy is not usually indicated, so it is not frequently performed. What we usually see in clinical practice is that hypertension typically precedes the development of either proteinuria or kidney insufficiency, and there is no obvious cause of kidney disease in these cases. So in, in a way, you might say that the, the most definitive way by which you diagnose hypertensive nephrosclerosis is really by a kidney biopsy. Um, but going back to your question, it is not typically performed in these cases. So again, the diagnosis is pretty much inferred from the clinical picture. So I just wanted to take a step back and something you said earlier about patients with diabetic kidney disease as well. So do patients with diabetic kidney disease typically also have hypertensive nephrosclerosis? Do you see that in your practice that they're kind of, they, you see both um, in these patients, both diabetic nephropathy and hypertensive nephrosclerosis? So majority of the patients um, who present with chronic kidney disease have both diabetes and or hypertension. Yeah. So it is it is uh, something that's really very common in CKD clinics that you see these two diseases 
sort of hand in hand in causing progressive renal decline. And that's why the treatments mostly uh, are geared towards treating both diabetes and hypertension. As in the end, they sort of share a, um, a, a single pathway that leads to glomerular sclerosis or uh, renal atrophy. Right. The other thing I wanted to ask you was, there are patients that come in with hypertension that may have renal artery stenosis too, right? So yes. how do you differentiate between those patients and patients with hypertensive nephrosclerosis? Is there a difference in the imaging that you might do in these patients to really kind of help you decide whether a patient's hypertension is secondary to the nephrosclerosis or secondary to renal artery stenosis? So when one presents with uh, chronic kidney disease, part of the workup is that you try to differentiate whether it is uh, due to hypertension, due to diabetes, due to other glomerular disease causes, due to polycystic kidney disease, so on and so forth. Renal artery stenosis is just one of those many differential diagnoses. Mm -hmm. When you see renal artery stenosis, or well, let me put it this way, you usually suspect renal artery stenosis in a patient who is who presents with uh, hypertension at a very young age, or who presents with initial diagnosis of hypertension at a very advanced age. Uh, at a young age, it's usually related to fibromuscular dysplasia, while in advanced age patients, it tends to be related to atherosclerotic uh, vascular disease. So those, it's, it's kind of a different pathway. And um, again, when we work patients up uh, for, well, let's say when they present for the first time with chronic kidney disease, we have to consider each of the differential uh, and move along each of them before we say, okay, this patient most likely has hypertensive nephrosclerosis or diabetic kidney disease, so on and so forth. Gotcha. So my next question is, what does the progression of this disease look like over time? Can you elaborate a little bit more on the association between hypertension and progressive kidney disease? So let, let, let me put it, to answer that question, let me put it this way. So the, the two most common causes of kidney failure in the U.S. are diabetes and hypertension. Um, hypertension right now is the second most common cause of end-stage kidney disease in the United States. If we look at the trials, uh, I, I'll mention there's a couple of trials that are important uh, in this in answering this question. There's the Mr. Fit trial, which is multi multiple risk factor intervention trial, and the HDFP, uh, or hypertension detection and follow-up program. And both of these trials seem to explain some of the reasons for the increased incidence of hypertensive nephrosclerosis as a cause of end-stage kidney disease and why they progress. Uh, so number one, we have to consider the number of hypertensive patients is so large, such that even a small number or small percent of the at risk constitutes a large number. Number two, the rate of progression is generally too slow, such that many patients at risk cannot be detected by even five to seven year studies. Third, in the absence of a kidney biopsy, which we discussed earlier, many patients, particularly non-blacks, diagnosed as having hypertensive nephrosclerosis may actually have a different cause of kidney disease. And lastly, we have to emphasize that African-Americans tend to have a unique genetic variant. This is the APOL1 gene that likely interacts with hypertension, which is responsible for their propensity to developing FSGS or focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, as well as end-stage kidney disease. So I wanted to ask you, when typically these patients are diagnosed with hypertension, typically probably at their primary care doctor's office, my question to you is, at what point do they get referred to you? Um, uh, is it at a more advanced stage? And what, what does that look like, that transition of care? So in, in the past, I would say probably uh, a decade or so ago, uh, there's been a lot of publications highlighting the late referral to nephrologists. And this... Um, the studies actually suggest uh, sort of uh, had the uh, recommended a movement for 
for uh, early referral to nephrologists because what they've demonstrated in these studies is that patients who tend to be referred to nephrologists late tend to have poorer outcomes because they get referred to transplant later. They, they get referred for AV fistula or AV graft creation later. And patients usually are not well versed about the dialysis modalities uh, because they are referred too late. Um, so nowadays uh, we are seeing patients who are referred appropriately. You know, uh, we, they are referred early, uh, at, um, like when they have the stage three or four chronic kidney disease, they are already referred to us instead of being referred when they are stage five. So th this is something that that's important, although there are still situations where, you know, th they're not referred. And this goes back to the importance of educating our primary care providers uh, as to when it is uh, the right time to refer to nephrology. Very good. Thank you for answering that. So now I'll transition to treatment. Um, wh what does the treatment plan look like for these patients with uh, hypertension, hypertensive nephrosclerosis? And what's the primary goal in treatment? When so, treating um, patients? so um, certainly, you know, to answer that question, we have to emphasize that first and foremost, lifestyle modifications, which includes diet, is the first step in the approach of these patients. Uh, whenever we talk about treatment of hypertension, everybody jumps into the pharmacological aspect right away. But you know, we have to take a step back and say, the pharmacologic as uh, treatment modalities work only if lifestyle modifications are uh, put into place first. Okay, so that uh, I want to emphasize that when we get to the pharmacological options. We know ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are the drugs of choice for renal protection in patients with proteinuric chronic kidney disease. Now, if we look at the literature and we talk about hypertensive nephrosclerosis, we always have to bring up this important study called the AASK study, which stands for African American Study of Kidney Disease and Hypertension. This study was published um, um, in the early 2000s, uh, I want to say 2002, um, and this enrolled uh, 1,094 African Americans with long-standing hypertension, slow progressive chronic kidney disease, and proteinuria well, around mean around 500 to 600 milligrams per day. The primary endpoint is the rate of change in GFR, and the secondary endpoint include endpoints rather included time to the uh, first event, including the 50% decline in GFR, actual decrease in GFR of 25 ml per minute per 1.7 meters square, as well as onset of kidney failure or death. So in this study, patients were randomized to receive Bramipril or Metoprolol or Amlodipine. And at the interim analysis, the rate of loss of GFR after the first three months and incidence of secondary composite endpoints were significantly lower in the Ramipril group as compared to Amlodipine group. However, after approximately four years, the mean rate of change in GFR and the rate of secondary composite endpoints were similar with both blood pressure goals. And so this suggests that the lower blood pressure goal may not necessarily provide any further benefit in slowing progression of kidney disease. Regarding the difference between the agents, Ramipril significantly decreased the secondary clinical composite endpoint as compared to metoprolol or amlodipine. There was no significant difference between amlodipine and the metoprolol groups. So in if I apply all of this, all of the studies, the ASK, the sprint trial, uh, so on and so forth, to my practice, in my practice, I usually use an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker and combine it with either a calcium channel blocker or a diuretic. So those that's my sort of go to pharmacological um, um, treatment for for hypertension in these patients. If we go to the uh, question of what is the target blood pressure or blood pressure goal for these patients, the blood pressure goal of less than 130 over 80 in my opinion, is a reasonable and evidence-based blood pressure goal in patients with chronic kidney disease. Current evidence based on literature uh, tell us that 
blood pressure less than 130 over 80 reduces future mortality risk. In proteinuric patients with chronic kidney disease, lower blood pressure has been shown to reduce CKD progression. It becomes confusing or it becomes, uh, how would I put it? Um, it becomes more gray when we look at the patients with end stage kidney disease because the effects of intensive blood pressure lowering in these patients is uncertain. And I think there are two reasons for this. Number one, the trials uh, that look into this are really short in duration for us to make any definitive conclusions on that. And then we also have to consider that acute hemodynamic effects of lowering blood pressure can actually lead to decrease in GFR. So that's why in patients for end stage kidney disease, it's really difficult to say what is the target blood pressure. While in patients with chronic kidney disease and in my practice, I usually use a target of less than 130 over 80. I see. Okay. So typically you achieve that with dual therapy, not just monotherapy. Sometimes it may require even triple therapy, I assume, or three antihypertensives. That's right. Uh, the, the recommendation of the guidelines right now is to use combination therapy. And the reason for using combination therapy is because you are actually addressing different aspects of the blood pressure equation. Uh, yeah. And in so doing, you're able to use lower doses in getting a target blood pressure of less than 130 over 80. In the past, uh, there used to be something called the step care approach to treatment, wherein they start using the maximum dose of the medications before they add the other medication. That approach actually was abandoned simply because by the time you get to the next medication, the patient has already been suffering from side effects of the high dose of the first medication that was used. I see. <clears throat> so... Thank you for providing this very comprehensive overview of, of, of hyper, hypertensive nephrosclerosis. I think the takeaway today is that uh, this is a complex disease. It's not uh, just hypertension, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a more complex disease than that. And uh, I really appreciate you going through each and every aspect of it, including pathophysiology, diagnosis, as well as treatment. And I also want to thank uh, the NEPHU community for tuning in, and we hope that you enjoyed this discussion on hypertensive nephrosclerosis. We will see you next time here on NEPHU. Thank you.